morning. Thank you everyone for coming here to this, uh, this beta of Death Con China. It's been pretty exciting. It's been great to be here as well. Um, so I'm Zaz, um, and uh, this talk is about forensic resistant data destruction uh, with a constraint of one minute, and I'll get into all the details. Um, first of all, though, um, because we're hackers, uh, we, we like to uh, give respect to those that helped us out along the way, especially with some old school ANSI art. So this is my thanks slide to everyone that helped me with this project. I had a ton of help with this. You'll see uh, from, from uh, what I'll show you uh, with the photography, visuals, getting all the licenses and permits and the substances required for this. Uh, so big shout out to all those other hackers up there that helped me with this. Um, but here's the motivation for this work. Um, the motivation is the security aspects of the things that we throw away, right? The stuff we throw in the trash. Um, some of us who have been around for a while remember going trashing, right? The old school uh, industrial espionage. Um, getting the secrets that people didn't want their competitors uh, or criminals or the general public to know. Um, we used to go through the trash, right? It's just like a lot of things that people throw away. So, you know, old phone system manuals, right? Like, uh, like with the, the freakers used to go and get. Uh, looking, for, looking for passwords and stuff in the, in the dumpster. Um, but now, the stuff that gets thrown away is increasing exponentially, right? So we're not just looking for printouts anymore. Um, we can hold in our hands a device that contains terabytes of information, right? And that stuff does get thrown out. Uh, so here are some examples of where we see that security risk happening. Um, printers and copiers, right? They're all digital now. They used to be fully, fully optical, uh, but now they scan because you can email the PDF to yourself later. You can go to these copiers and stuff. And so there's a lot of research out there on recovering old copiers and printers and then recovering uh, interesting information from the hard disks. There's actually a big report out in the United States just yesterday uh, from a news group that went out and saw that this is still a problem. Right? They recovered all these confidential medical records, sensitive information that were uh, still stored. Some printers don't even erase the documents that are stored on a disk until, you need to, until they need it or forensically recoverable. Um, another example that's, that's coming increasingly into prominence, even in civilian circles, is sensitive information in devices that don't stay put. Right? Your drone aircraft uh, might contain all kinds of information. Uh, your driverless car. Right, like contains all kind, contain all kinds of, pri uh, of uh, private information or um, information that uh, a company considers their proprietary information. Right, so like Google's maps or whatever might be in their driverless car if you can get access to that hard disk. So we have to care about this media that, go, that goes for a ride somewhere. Um, but the point of this research really is what if someone tries to take that data from you when you're still using it? Okay, so you're not throwing it away, um, you're still using it. And so this is, was originally inspired by, by some work that was presented at DEF CON 19 by Shane Lawson, Bruce Potter, and Devian Malum. Great presentation, so that's how I lost my eye. Uh, they were working with some data center scale stuff and they, wanted to, they were, had this thought experiment, what if we needed to get rid of this really fast? Um, so here are the goals of the research. We want to be able to flip a switch and have our drives gone, not a single bit left standing. Um, now you might say, well, hey, all my drives are encrypted, right? So I just don't care. Um, the, uh, the crypto doesn't necessarily save you because crypto is only as strong as the security of your key, right? And the key has to be stored somewhere. And you may be surprised by where your key ends up. Uh, in, in particular, it can be unexpectedly recoverable for your physical media. So, you know, we just need to be careful about this. And the other thing, of course, data center scale that I mentioned, we want to be able to destroy a lot of drives quickly. And we're going to also consider as our threat model the ultimate adversary, right? An extremely high capability criminal adversary like a bad nation state intelligence service, right? So it has the maximum forensic capabilities. So let's take a look at what's done industrially first, right? This is what we're competing with, with if you work for a company and you need to get rid of your data securely. So if you want to decommission your disk, then the standard method is you degauss the drive if it's a magnetic storage system, and then you throw it into some giant industrial shredder like that that reduces it to a lot of little component parts. Uh, the good thing here is also they're all mixed together. Um, so once again, if you're destroying something, you have to predict your adversary. So uh, what we know is that forensic organizations with unlimited funding, uh, I think you probably know who I'm talking about, they are able to exploit 
physically correct, um, physically destroyed drives that have been collected. So I, as part of this research, I talked to military intelligence officials from the United States who had been in Iraq collecting data, um, and they were under instructions that if they found any physical media, no matter its physical condition, no matter how it had been physically destroyed, they would collect that and send it in as long as it had not also been burnt. So we know that there are capabilities out there to recover some information from even physically destroyed drives. So here's your like takeaway at home if you want to destroy your own stuff, if you want to really nuke it from orbit, you should degauss your drive, you should then crush and shred it, and then you should burn the rem remnants, and then if you're really paranoid, you should throw those remnants away in separate places. Just split them up, right? Really make things difficult. But here are the rules for the research I'm going to present today. And these are adapted pretty much straight up from the DEFCON 19 presentation. Uh, we have one U for our server containing all our drives. We have one U above and below that in our rack for whatever we want to put in there for protection. So that means we can have hot gas extraction, we can have just slabs of concrete, anything we want to, to uh, contain what we're doing here. We have 60 seconds to get to completion. Um, we want to not set off our fire system, right? Because we don't want sprinklers going off. We don't want halon systems flooding, flooding the room. Uh, we want to contain our damage within our storage equipment because we don't want to damage neighboring equipment, and we also don't want to damage the neighboring humans, whoever's in the data center. So we want to keep them safe. So those are the rules. Let's take a look at what we're trying to destroy here, what hard disks are made out of. Most of the drives you'll find still in a data center are made up of spinning platters. Um, and those platters are made usually of aluminum. Um, and increasingly now, especially in laptop computers, they're made of glass. Um, glass is very easy to destroy. The reason they're made of glass, by the way, is because it's really easy to make a very flat platter that you can spin at a high rate of speed. Um, that, that sort of machining problem can be easier with glass. But mostly in the data center, we'll see aluminum, and that's what I'm going to concentrate on, because glass smashes very easily. Um, the, the surface coating, the aluminum doesn't store anything, that's just a substrate. The coating, we have underlayers of cobalt, nickel, and iron. And then we have the magnetic alloy, which is cobalt, chromium, and platinum. So we actually have some valuable metals inside a hard disk. And those layers are separated by four atoms of ruthenium. Very, very thin coating, but nevertheless, that coating makes them extremely chemically resistant. Ruthenium is pretty unreactive, so that's why I don't cover chemical attacks here. Um, then also a little bit at the end on solid state drives. A solid state drive is nothing special in terms of its physical design. It's just a bunch of high performance flash chips soldered to a circuit board. So any method that works on circuitry will work on an SSD. So let's look at the methods that I'm going to cover here. I'm going to look at thermal attacks using heat. I'm going to look at kinetic attacks using physical force and electric attacks. First up, thermal. So our goal here is that we want to exceed the temperature at which the stabilized spins of our magnetic material that are, that are aligned and storing our magnetic data become disorganized. That's called the Curie point. So for cobalt, which is what we care about here, that's a little bit above 1,000 C. That's pretty hot. So for each of these sections, I'm going to tell you what I didn't try. So in this case, didn't try flame torches because Bruce and Shane and Deviant covered that at DEF CON 19. Flameless chemical reactions I was pretty excited for, and I did some research there. I couldn't find any that got hot enough. Um, an electric oven, you know, we got time constraints for our minute, and then also it's just not that interesting. And then inductive heating or melting, just like an inductive foundry works when you're melting down your metal to cast it. I didn't look at this because we know it works, and then secondly, uh, there's a lot of infrastructure that's required for those things. Um, your little induct inductive furnace has a giant power supply. So first of all, went into my workshop and said, well, let's, let's start off with thermal. What's the, what's the hottest thing I have in the workshop? Let's give a shot with a plasma cup. We've got a nice high temperature jet of electrified plasma coming out of this thing. You can cut through a pretty much unlimited section of steel with these guys. You know, if you want to, want to cut up an inch or two of steel plate, it's a great thing to have in the shop. So, just dump a ton of heat into this drive, and uh, the good thing about this here too is you get a little flame out the back side to know that it's done. You'll see that coming out of the bottom just there, and some globs of molten metal coming out as well. So, 
just like the, the timer on the microwave. So like the, like the ding when you're done, 45 seconds, less than a minute. So looking pretty good. So let's open up the drive and take a look. Um, you can see here the screws have already been taken out uh, and I'm wearing gloves now because I burned myself several times trying to get this hard disk open because it takes a long time to cool down. It got really hot. Um, you can see here uh, the drive was spinning when I started this up and you can see that uh, ring. Here's another look at that showing damage to the surface of the drive but it stopped spinning pretty quickly. So as it heated up that spindle seized and we didn't have any spin anymore but we cut a nice hole in the disk and here we go, um, looking at the platters underneath, and you can see that hole goes all the way through, and there is the whole, the whole package. So what we can see from this is that although we couldn't rely on the spin of the disc to destroy the whole thing, we definitely destroyed that platter nicely. So what we would need is a ring of plasma ejectors, very easy to make, we can totally fabricate something like that. So this is an extremely feasible method. Great. So I'm feeling, I'm feeling pretty excited here, um, and uh, I feel like my research is off to a good start. But I got to thinking, well, these platters are made of aluminum. Aluminum is an extremely reactive metal. Actually, you just can't really tell because it's normally covered in a protective oxide coating. So what if we could use the drive itself as the fuel, and all we would need is to push in a loxidizer and then have everything take place? So I thought, well, we could think about a nozzle that appears to drive and pump oxygen in, we just need to get it going. So I built up a little oxygen injector rig here, and you can see the wires off to the side, which has a little tiny igniter in it just to get things going. And here we go. See, the igniter goes off. because you can see that the oxygen tube is melting and we were worried about starting a fire we couldn't control. So we thought, well, we better stop this. Safety first, right? So here we are with some uh, high-speed footage of this. You can see the little uh, igniter wire goes off and immediately things go gangbusters inside that drive, right? Oxygen is one of the most reactive things you can pump into a, pump into a, a system and plenty of heat coming out here. There's, there's a lot of combustion going on on this drive. So this looks pretty good. Let's take a look at the inside it. And, well, here's the outside. You can see, once again, there's no fuel in there except for the drive itself. So everything's being provided uh, by the unit. And opened up, and you can see a lot of combustion has happened in there. And if we had been less experimental about this, if we'd used the metal tube for our oxygen, this thing would have consumed the entire drive. So there we are with the drive cleaned, and you can see we've really started to combust that platter, right? So despite the fact that the uh, coating is chemically unreactive under normal circumstances, pretty much everything oxidizes, and so we're just going to eat away that drive. No problem at all. So this method, potentially feasible. I figured this shows what we need to do. There wasn't the need for further experimentation there. But you know, what I really was getting at here um, when I started the thermal attacks is because when you talk to anyone about how to destroy hard disks immediately, pretty much everyone has a one-word response to that. They're like, oh, thermite. So I was like, yeah, all right. We sort of, we, we think this is going to work, but who's really tried it? Who out there that says thermite has really tried it? I certainly hadn't, so let's take a look. But we know that the military uses thermite as a data destruction method. They make these thermite incendiary hand grenades. They're actually um, issued for the purposes of getting rid of sensitive stuff uh, and equipment. And what I really wanted to do here was I wanted to make thermite into some kind of a paste or slurry that I could inject into the drive when necessary, fill it up in a few seconds, set it off, boom, right? So it's going to be totally awesome. Uh, unfortunately, this failed. I don't have time to show you those failures, but they're not very exciting because they're failures. Um, but anyway, uh, here's what thermite is. Anyone that's taken high school chemistry probably remembers. It's a, stand, it's a standard oxygen swap reaction between aluminum metal and iron oxide. That oxygen just changes partners like it's at a swing dance and the aluminum becomes oxidized. You get molten iron out of it and a lot of energy. So 2500 C is the theoretical temperature you can reach uh, with, with a, a block of thermite. So 
Uh, if you want to make this at home, that's the ratio, three to one by weight. And let's give it a shot. So here's my first experiment here was, well, looking inside a hard disk, there's sort of quite a lot of empty space that's not needed right there behind those read heads. So even though my slurry injection is not going to work, maybe I can just modify my drive to put stuff in there. And the other good thing is, there's some of the pins on the drive bus that aren't used. So I can use some of those pins to make a little electric igniter and put in my 15 gram baggie of thermite, seal the drive up, and it actually still works. There's no, um, you know, if you're careful about it and you don't uh, get, it, get things too messy in there, it's great. So here we are with our 15 grams of thermite, real time. Doesn't look like it's going to be a containment problem, right? A little bit of flame there, we can deal with that, no problem. So here's uh, what it looked like after that, and definitely things got hot in there. This looks, looks pretty pretty melty. Um, but as soon as we start taking a closer look, we can see a lot of this is just dust and debris. There's nothing that a forensic lab couldn't deal with pretty easily. Here we are with a fully clean disk, and there's basically no damage to it at all. Uh, sure, the electronics is, is cactus, but uh, the, the platters themselves, you know, no problem at all. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust, I wouldn't trust that. Uh, wouldn't trust my life to the data being unextractable from that. So that's a fail. But I'm not ready to give up on thermite yet, because everyone knows that's the way to do it. So, you know, taking a closer look at those military grenades, they actually don't use regular straight up thermite. They actually use a variant called thermate, which is regular thermite 30, 70%, and then 30% of barium nitrate. The barium nitrate um, actually increases the burning temperature, and it also produces gas, and the gas grows everything around. So, you know, it just makes it everything, everything a bit more violent. That's what we want here. So here's another 15 grams of thermate here inside a drive. And we can see just from that real-time footage that we have a, a lot more violent of a reaction going on here. Here we are with a high-speed shot. Um, this is just taken with a, you know, uh, an off-the-shelf like Sony DS camera or something like that. I think it's about 240 frames per second. But uh, we can see we're getting a nice little pyrotechnic show here, squeezing out from within the, uh, from under the top of the drive. So certainly we're gonna have to think about our pyrotechnic containment here, but, you know, we're, de we're definitely kicking it up a notch with the kind of violence that we want here from our, from our substance. For time constraints, I'm gonna click ahead. So here we are opening it up, wearing my gloves, and wow. We can, we can immediately see that something a bit more violent has gone on inside that disk. Actually, did pretty good. Yeah, it's um, quite impressive compared to a straight up thermite. I guess there's a reason why the military uses this formula. See, you can see I was impressed at the time when I saw that. So, let's take a closer look. We can see here that that molten iron that's been produced by the thermite has really been spread out everywhere, all those little beads. Um, and once we clean it off, we can see a few interesting things here. Uh, we can see that we've globbed molten iron onto the reed heads. We can see that we've actually delaminated the platter here. That's great. We know we're getting up to the temperatures we need when we're doing that. Um, and we can see we've welded the platters together too. Uh, so things look pretty good. But the rest of that platter still looks in pretty good shape. You know, so I think even though we're getting one side of it hot enough, not confident enough about the other side. So, you know, we're, we're, we're being like uh, honest scientists here. We're gonna call this a fail. Well, there are other types of thermite. I'm not ready to give up on thermite yet because everyone says that's the way to go. And so one such variant that uh, I've read about is copper thermite. This similar reaction, we use copper oxide instead of iron oxide. And uh, once again, for those following along at home, if you want to make it, 4.4 to 1, copper oxide to aluminum by weight. Now, copper thermite is a very aggressive thermite. So here's a little unconfined pile with a torch. Fast, right? We're, we're almost at like gunpowder speed there. So, hey, let's do it. Let's put it in there and see how it looks.
Boom. So I want you to keep watching this, uh, even though there's this giant cloud of smoke. Um, keep, wa keep watching down in the lower right of the screen here. There's the top of the drive that flew off, right? So it just busted those screws right out. But keep watching, there's more to come. And there it is, there's the drive itself. So from a standing start on top of that cinder block, it rebounded up several feet in the air, also produced a giant cloud of toxic smoke, and Miles and I had to run out of his laboratory into the street and explain ourselves to his neighbors. So a little bit embarrassing, but uh, let's take a look at how it looked. Here is uh, the top plate. You can see where the uh, screws ripped through on the corners and beautiful patina on the plate itself. You know? So totally uh, a valid uh, method for people interested in doing pyrotechnic art. Um, here's the disc itself. Also looks kind of you know, like a steampunk art disc now, like very Victorian. Um, closer look there, we can see uh, lots of Lots of stuff has gone. It's, we, we've certainly spewed material all through the drive. Um, let's take a closer look over here. We can see we've made beads of elemental copper that have stuck all over the place. You can, you can take a look here and see all these little bits of copper. And you know, you, you kind of feel intuitively like covering electronics in copper probably isn't good for them. Uh, oh, that's there. There's some more like, like nice beads of copper there in the corner. So, once again, we open it up, we use our extremely scientific forensic cleanup lab, <laughs> the side of Miles' photo lab, and wow, you know, it cleans up pretty good. There's a, there's a little close-up shot. So we can see, you know, there's, there's definitely some copper that's stuck to things, but even though we, we might feel intuitively that copper is not good for electronics, we're not really talking about electronics here inside the drive, at least not the bits that we care about. We're talking about magnetic storage, and copper is not magnetic. So your sufficiently motivated forensic organization could easily polish that copper off again, and I don't think, I don't think this is gonna work for you. So I class this as infeasible, but a lot of fun. <laughs> but I'm still not ready to give up on thermite because when you ask someone how to destroy drives, they always say thermite. So, I'm gonna make a case, and I'm gonna pack as much thermite in as I could fit in our one use server with the drive. So, this stack here, that's exactly one U in height. Um, I'm gonna put 250 grams now of iron aluminum thermite in here, um, and see if I can just melt through the top of the drive. So what I've done is I've cast the top of the drive out of a refractory ceramic material with a cavity to pack our thermite in. It can survive the heat, and hopefully we're just gonna totally toast this drive. Gotta, gotta clamp down here to make sure we don't have any hard disks jumping around the place this time. So first thing you notice here in this high speed is that containment is gonna remain a challenge. It's not, uh, not the, not the neatest and cleanest thing that's happening here. In fact, um, this shot set the carpet on fire in my friend's house, and so like a large chunk of the corner of that missing out. Sorry, Miles. But look at look at what's going on here. Even after that initial spray, we've got just blowtorch happening here inside this box. So it's, look, it's looking pretty good. I'm feeling I'm feeling confident. So, let's open it up, see how it looks. Got our photographic lights set up there because we're pros. Yeah, well, it's like it just came out of the oven, right? Could, could be like uh, some kind of baked good. There is a closer look and we can see again some interesting things here. We can see that we've actually melted a small hole in the top of the drive, drive enclosure. And we can see big beads everywhere of that molten iron that we produced, or formerly molten iron. Once again, we open it up and what we see is that the electronics again has just melted into slag. But 
the disc itself, you know, we still got that shiny surface. Maybe we reached the temperature we needed, maybe not. It's hard to say. There's the, there's the molten slag. Uh, but here it is after we clean it up. And once again, we just don't know how much damage we caused to those platters. Maybe they got to the temperature we needed, maybe not. Would you trust your life to it? I wouldn't. So I would say unreliable. So that's it for thermal. You know, I, the, when, the thing is, and this is something that Bruce and Shane and Deviant found in DEFCON 19 as well, is that the bottom of that disc is a giant slug of aluminum. It's a massive heat sink. And so you just have to be aware of how much heat you need to dump into a drive in order to, in order to burn it. So sure, you can destroy a drive with thermite, but just be aware of how much that you need. But now it's time to move on to kinetic methods. So our goal here with the kinetic, that's physical destruction, is we want to deform, spindle, mutilate our drive preferably separate it into pieces and make it so it's going to be really hard for mechanical scanning to read the surface of that drive. Um, so what that means is, if, it, if you're going up against the most powerful adversary, then you should also degauss the drive too. You know, redundancy, be safe. So here's some ideas I didn't explore here. I didn't look at, um, they, they, do they make disc crushes that operate vertically? Because of our 1U constraint, you could make one that went horizontally. I knew I could do it, so it wasn't too interesting. Uh, and then also using various high pressure cutting tools, like a water jet cutter or something like that. We totally could do that, uh, but you need a lot of excess infrastructure. It's the same as the inductive methods. So that wasn't, wasn't worth exploring within the constraints. But my first idea was, what about puncturing? Right? Because I have a nail gun at home that's designed to fire nails into concrete. So, um, I figured, you know, if you could fire a nail into a concrete, you could fire it through a drive. Here's a, here's a video of that nail gun. Um, it basically uses a 22 caliber cartridge. So it's like a 22 caliber bullet. Uh, and you fire it into some concrete. This is at 480 frames per second. And still it's so fast you can't see the nail. And you can see, it makes mince me to that cinder block, right? So, if we can punch a cinder block, I feel like we can probably punch through a hard disk. So here we are. What I've done here is I've milled the end off the disk so that it's still spinning, you can still see it, but I have to do it upside down because you actually have to hit this thing with a hammer. Um, and you can see where I already tried it on the top and I bent the top, so we had to do it from the base. But here we are at 480, bam. No problem at all, goes straight through those drives, nails the bladders, cracks the uh, molding at the base. No problem at all. So I feel like this is good. And at the same time that I did this, even though I have one of these at home, this I shot out in LA with Miles Sledlip, and so I had to borrow a nail gun from somewhere because I couldn't take it with me on the plane. And the guy I borrowed the nail gun from also had a pneumatic nail gun. And he said, hey, you want to try this as well? I was like, of course. We're doing science. We have to try everything. So here's the pneumatic nail gun. And I didn't have high hopes for this, you know, because like, whatever, it's a pneumatic nail gun. It's designed for nailing wood, not concrete. But as you can see, boom, goes straight through. So here's what it looks like afterwards. You can see those platters are squished together, they're warped. If we had a whole bunch, like we could make some kind of a pancake cylinder that fired like a whole bunch of nails right around the drive, no problem at all, especially if we were degaussing as well. So I say this method, eminently feasible. But what I'm really interested in here in the kinetic method is high explosives. Uh, because this is some work that I've wanted to do for a long time. Uh, in general, not just painting the hard disks. So, for a start, there's no doubt, right? We, we know that we can destroy a drive with high explosives. That's not in question. What we're interested in here, uh, also, we get thermal factors for free with high explosives, because they get hot too. So we can do explosive welding. So it's a great method. It's very violent, very destructive. But we know, it, we know it can work. What we're interested here, number one, is can we confine that explosion? Can we do something that keeps that in the rack equipment? And then also, this is the bit that I really wanted to do for years and years, was experiment with these new tech techniques. And in particular, I wanted to 3D print high explosives penetrators, um, which is work that hasn't been done before. So let me speak a little bit about that. Um, when you have an explosive, it directs its energy all over the place, in every direction. But what we care about is directing that energy to one place. So here's a little illustration of that. As an aside, I have to say, um, 
this interesting like cultural notion, right? Is that China invented fireworks, but Americans turned it into like a hobby that people do in their homes. America is a very weird place. So this is at the annual convention of the American amateur pyrotechnists. And what these guys are trying to do here is they're trying to knock down the rack that this explosive is suspended on. So this is just happening at a county fairground. You can see how happy everyone is, right? Because they've destroyed this rack. But in order to destroy that cross piece, they had to have a huge explosion at that distance because all that energy is going in every direction. It's not concentrated. But we, we can't afford to do that in our rack. So what we want to do is direct that explosion. And what we're going to make use of is a thing called the Monroe effect, or what is better known in general circles as a shape charge. So what that is, is a block of high explosives that's got a shape cut in it. Uh, that shape is usually a cone, but it can also be a linear, like if you stretch the cone into a line, so a triangle groove. And what happens here is if you place that cavity up against the material that you want to damage, and you set your high explosive off, the cavity, sort of counterintuitively, has the effect of concentrating that explosive. And it concentrates the shock wave into a kind of a jet, and it'll cut through that material. And so where that cavity was, you get much more damage than everywhere else. And so you form jets. You can also, if you line the explosive, you can form what's called an explosive form penetrator. So, for example, here's if you buy one of these things, which you can do if you have the licenses, um, you'll see you've got your explosive cone, you got a line there, uh, and some standoff distance, and then the penetrating jet will cut through. So having a metal line that greatly increases that penetration. The, the jet is actually composed partially of high temperature metal, and so what you want is a metal that um, is very dense and very ductile, so copper or tantalum, it's one place you'll see tantalum outside of a capacitor. Uh, so here's an example of some commercial penetrators. These are something that's used in the oil and gas industry. So when you drill your oil well, you don't want the oil to come up while you're still drilling it. You want to sort of seal everything off, and then when you're ready to get the oil, you send these things down the hole, you use them to punch holes in the metal, and out comes the oil and you slurp it all up. So a few things to note here, you can see at the top, um, there's a little foil coating that exposes the high explosive to whatever you're gonna set it off with, a blasting cap or some detonation cord. And then also sometimes you have a built-in little uh, cup that gives you the standoff distance for optimum formation of that jet. So when we did this work, it was out in Colorado with a local bomb squad. We needed a place to do it. They had a, an explosive range and they said, okay, because they like research too. And they also said, hey, we got some stuff we need to get rid of. Can you guys blow it up for us when you do this research? We said, of course we can, no problem at all. So they gave us some of these oil well perforators. And so at the end of the day, we had a couple left over. And so this is just to show you guys what happens here. Um, we can put them in the ground in a hole with a jet pointing up so that we didn't have a lot of things spraying all over the place. Um, and here we are setting it off. And here's a still from that video where you can see those two jets forming and going straight up. This is an amazing photograph. Um, because not only do we have like this great still of those jets, I mean, you can see this, these things are this big, right? They're in the palm of my hand, and this massive jet. Uh, we can also see that's the, the spray from the blasting cap that we set the deck cord off with. And then this has all happened so fast that that cord, that detonating cord, which is high explosives inside a plastic tube, the explosives has fired because we fired both of our perforators, but the plastic hasn't shattered yet and gone away. So that's how fast this all happens. So here, just proof of concept, right? POC or GTFO, we're gonna strap an old perforator to a hard disk and see what happens. Bang, things fly around a little bit, but uh, that's, we don't care about that yet. So here's some, some slow-mo footage. You can see a chunk of the disc fly off there to camera left. And after recovery, we can see we've sliced right through the, the bottom molding of that disc. 
and here are the platters. So that jet has just gone right through those aluminum platters like they were a piece of cheese or something. So that looks pretty good. Here's all the bits that we recovered from that disc. Um, so you can see, we didn't find one half of the bottom, but uh, the platters are what we care about. But hey, what's this over to the side here? That's interesting, we didn't notice that. That's a hole that those penetrators, after going through, well that one penetrator, after going through the disc, it punched that hole in the metal plate. That's the other side of that hole. This is the ground underneath it, and that's that piece of wire is the wire that we stuck in that hole to see how deep it went, 15 inches. So uh, that's 37 and a half centimeters, roughly, in metric. That's a deep hole, so, all right. If we're gonna be using these shape charges, we're gonna have a containment problem, because that's gonna get through one U of concrete. No problem at all. But let's take a look at the, the stuff that, that, that I think I'm, that I was really interested in here, which is the, our design of our Monroe effect using 3D printing. So, um, we have a few parameters we can adjust for our shape charge. Those are the apex angle of our cone, the standoff distance, and then the overall height of the charge. Uh, so here's some stuff from, uh, from an explosives engineering research paper from the 60s that show how one of those parameters affects things. That's the apex angle versus the detonation velocity, or the velocity of the jet. And we can see a pretty clear inverse relationship. So the steeper our angle is, the faster of a jet we're gonna get. So we take those parameters, we can generate a parametric 3D model uh, for our digital high explosives fabrication with 3D printing. So for example, in something like OpenSCAD, allows us to write code that turns into 3D models and we can have uh, parametric functions. Now 3D printing, any new material, is a materials handling problem, right? It's basically you have to do a lot of material science to figure out how you're gonna effectively deposit that substance. So things like how are you gonna extrude it? If you're gonna melt it, what temperature? Uh, how are you gonna deal with supports if you've got overhangs? Um, what about internal voids, right? If you need homogeneity, which in this case we do, how are we gonna make sure that we get that? These are things that if you had a 3D printing company, you could easily spend a couple of years getting right, or longer. I don't wanna have to do this with this research project, so I need some way to get around it, right? So the hacker in me is thinking like, ah, oh, what am I gonna do about this? So I don't have to solve that problem. That's not the problem I'm interested in. So what I decided was, what about printing on a traditional printer very thin walled plastic enclosures, and then putting a self-compacting explosive in it. So that explosive is gonna be the shape that I want it. It's gonna be void free, because it's self-compacting. In this case, I'm gonna use a liquid explosive. It just might work. Um, so again, I wanna to, to sort of toot my own horn here and say this is the first open literature example of 3D printing of high explosive geometries, and that's why I was really interested in doing this. So, what, what to use for an explosive. So I did some research and I found there are some liquid explosives out there on the market, um, but the, the, in particular the one I'm interested in was expensive, um, and yeah, I didn't want to pay for it, so I was like, I'd rather make it myself. Another, another sort of hacker mindset thing. So I developed this thing we call Field Expedient Liquid Explosive, or Felix. It's similar to these other ones you can get in the United States. Like I said before, you know how I said the United States is a very weird place? In the United States, everyone has like a fundamental right to shoot at things that explode, right? It's like, it's just part of, part of, part of the things that Americans take for granted is they, if they're gonna shoot at it, it can explode. You can't use this stuff for any other use, but you can use it for shooting at it. And so there's these things called Tannerite, Kind Pack, they're these ones that you can buy, they're two-part explosives. Each part individually is okay, when you mix them, you're only allowed to shoot at them. But they're solids, so I didn't want to just buy those. They're cheap, actually. Um, so instead, I found this other commercial product, and then I reverse engineered it and figured out how to make it myself. Um, instead of ammonium nitrate, it's basic high explosive substrate is nitromethane. So you might have heard of this um, as high test racing fuel, um, or also uh, certain kinds of model aircraft run on nitromethane. What this means is you can just buy this stuff from Amazon, uh, and then it's sensitized with an aluminum powder that's a particular size and stearic acid coated. Uh, and that's very, very important, getting that stearic acid ratio right. 
Uh, one of the good things here is that you can just ship this as hazardous materials. It's not explosive until it's mixed. Um, here's the chemical reaction with the stoichiometry. Um, the nitromethane is actually high explosive by itself, but it's very, very intense. You'll never get it to go by itself. But when it does decompose, it decomposes into a variety of gases and water, which at that temperature is also a gas. The good thing about this is that water goes on to react with the sensitizer. So it reacts with the aluminum, produces more hydrogen, more energy, uh, everything's great. Turns out the stoichiometric ratio is not what you want for mixing this. It'll work, but you'll, it'll be way more expensive because you use more aluminum than you need, and you'll see that coming up. So let's do this. My first idea was take that linear shape chart, that triangle groove, wrap around into a circle, and make an annulus that matches the hard disk. So there's my OpenSCAD model. There's my 3D printed container. Uh, you can see the other side showing the triangle groove wrapped around. And what we find is that we can fit about 60 grams of Felix into that slot. And it's a kind of a paste. You stick it in there, shake it around a bit, and it makes level, makes, gives you a nice void-free geometry. Uh, there it is strapped with a plastic cup to do the standoff distance and ready to insert a blasting cap and test it out. So here's our, our first shot with the annular charge. <laughs> Big bang, the hard disk stays pretty much where we left it, uh, which is good, but you'll see on the high speed shot here, um, we're still going to have to think carefully about our containment. There we go. Here's another shot with the, with the annular charge. And again in high speed. And there's, there's one of the results of those drives. So we can see a few interesting things from this result. Number one, as I mentioned before, the stoichiometry, the stoichiometric ratio is not what you want. We can see a lot of unconsumed aluminum there, right? We're just, we're, we're wasting money by using that much aluminum. Um, we can see that we've stripped those platters off the spindle and We've actually compressed and welded them together. And then we can see, though, that what we tried to achieve here, what we really wanted was that penetrating jet that in a ring shape that was going to cut through all those platters. We haven't done that. Um, we've only cut through in one place. And if we look at how we have our setup going on here, we can see very clearly that that one place we cut through, that's where the blasting cap was located. So we've done what we wanted to in a small area, but the... But the um, the cutting jet has not propagated around the ring. So let's try a different geometry. This is the great thing here. We can just 3D print whatever we want. So let's do a radial shape charge where those cutting grooves radiate around from the center. Um, there's our open SCAD model. And what we're going to do here is we're going to run a loop of deck cord around the top so that we can initiate everything at the same time from the top. And so there's a little top case there with a little hole to feed the depth port through. Uh, here's our 3D printed model. We can fit more Felix in it because there's more empty space. So we can get 100 grams in there. We're going to put some depth cord there around the top. And there it is all packaged up, ready to go. So here's, a, here's that shot. Things moved a little further this time. Here we are with a 960 high speed shot. Big explosion. Gonna have to work on that. Here we are with a GoPro long shot, 120. Bits of that disc go a long way. So when we found bits of that, what we can see is all the components were stripped off the uh, control board. Um, and there's the pieces of the platters. They're all welded together, plus they're shredded. Uh, we did a good job here. Uh, we can see there, like, just complete, complete explosive welding of the platters. So we're getting somewhere here. We're really, we're definitely destroying that disc, but we're not 
you know, 3D printing is doing a good job, but we're not taking taking care yet of our other goal, suppressing the blast and keeping everything in within one year. So let's think a bit about what we need here to do here to suppress that blast. We need to direct our energy into the drive, not everywhere else. We want to decouple that from our, our surrounding equipment. So we have our explosives against the disc, and we need some kind of damping material in between the explosives and the equipment shell. And so our damping material, what's that going to be? Let's think about it. We want to have some kind of matrix that compresses and absorbs energy and then has alternating incompressible parts to keep the matrix stable, right? We want to, you know, just the same as firing a bullet through a lot of layers of fabric, we want to absorb that energy as we go along. So we need some kind of foam, for example, maybe a liquid and gas foam. And it's got to be inexpensive, right? Because once again, we're trying to do this at, at scale. We can't afford really exotic materials. Well, what, what might we be able to use? What's, a, what's an inexpensive foam that you can get? And we also want to be able to inject that when we need to, because we don't want to have our piece of equipment full of foam all the time, because you know, we have to replace hard disks and stuff all the time, so we don't want to have goo constantly on our device. So what can we buy that's cheap, foamy, comes out when you press the button? Shaving cream. And this is something, you know, again, I was talking to a lot of experts when I did this research, and an explosives engineering instructor in Colorado said, hey, you might want to check this out. We do demos for this stuff. So let's give it a try. So here's a big shot. This is 41 inches of 100 grand green deck color. We don't care about the geometry right now. We just care about the blast. This is twice as big as the last blast. Plus our shaving cream. We put it in a box, fill it up, and let's see how it looks. So, you know, that box flies around, sure, uh, but we can see immediately that that blast is significantly smaller in terms of its envelope than the ones we did before. So let's take a look at our video and take single frames. This is the first frame of the explosion from each of those videos. Um, we did two experiments here with the shaving cream. This is with shaving cream. That's without on the, one of those previous hard disk shots. With from a second camera, without. You can really see the difference there. And you've got to keep in mind, the explosion on the left, this one, is twice as big in terms of explosive material as the one on the right. So that's, that's pretty serious suppression. So let's investigate that. So what we did, we have a 75 gram Felix shot. We built a little one year rack simulator here out of a steel plate with some angle steel. There we are all set up, <coughs> squeezing in the shaving cream. Put our sandbag on top to simulate our one U of concrete on top. And here we go. Not bad, not bad at all. Here we are with the slow mo shot at 960. And you know, that sandbag certainly moves, right? Because it's just sitting there, nothing's holding it down. And it's only sand, we dug it up from the dirt right next door. So if that was a slab of concrete that was bolted down, we could definitely suppress that blast. Take a look at the steel plate. There's like a slight dent in it, right? Compared to the, the shattering that we've, that we've done to our hard disk. Um, there's our bottom plate. We can see the, that we've definitely expanded out that angle line. So we'd have to care about the sides if this was in a rack. But the, uh, the plate itself has got a little dent, a little impression of the hard disk on it, but it's otherwise pretty much unscathed. So, summary of our kinetic approach with high explosives. With enough engineering effort, it just might work. <laughs> so moving on now to electric. Um, electric attacks, we want to use the fact that we have a lot of electricity in the data center, we've got the power. Let's use it against our meteor instead of for it. In particular, We've been doing spinning disks up until now. Now I want to take a look at SSDs. So again, what I didn't look at, nasty gaussing of, of drives, because the gaussing we know is a thing that we do. Uh, exotic electromagnetic pulse or microwave or RF attacks. Not time for it this time. 
But first of all, let's look at the exploding bridge wire effect. So my idea first was like, if we just dump a ton of high voltage into a flash chip, what's going to happen to it? Uh, in particular, I've done some experiments uh, with ex where if you pass enough current at enough of a rise, rise time, that wire will actually explode. And that's used in commercial detonators. Um, so here's my friend Miles' exploding bridge, bridge wire rig. We've used that many times. Um, we worked together uh, on a lot of these projects. Uh, it looks pretty messy, but it works. Uh, and here's what I'm going to use because at, at the time I did this, SSDs were very expensive. They're still pretty expensive. I didn't want to dump hundreds and hundreds of dollars. No one would give me any decommissioned ones because they're all still in service. So thanks to the MathWorks, who gave me a lot of free flash drives, I exploded them. So here's just what the exploding bridge wire looks Three, like. Two, one. It happens very fast. So here we are with a high speed shot at 960. And even at 960, it basically happens instantaneously. That wire is gone. You can see a lot of energy came out of that little wire. So first of all, I thought, well, let's just be fully kinetic here, right? Let's just wrap this around the um, SSD and see if we can just convert electricity to force, smash that drive. Three, two, one. It made it move at least. Let's take a closer look. Well, the wire vanished, but that drive just kind of bounced off camera. It doesn't look like it suffered a lot of damage. Uh, and sure enough, when we take a look, it's scorched. Uh, we decapped the chip on the bottom, which is the microcontroller. Uh, but certainly, I do not trust that that flash memory is, um, is, is inaccessible now, right? You could just remove that from the board and solder it somewhere else. So this method is not reliable. But really what I thought would work here is um, to put a huge high voltage power spike inside the chip itself. And the best way to do that is to raise the ground pin to a huge voltage because no one designs electronics with protection on, on the ground side against this kind of thing. They always do. If there's power protection, it's always on the power side. So wire it up into the, into the ground here and let's dump 15,000 volts into this chip. Three, two, <sighs> We see more pieces there. That's that's a good sign. And here we go. We're taking a look. What we've done is we've actually coupled that exploding wire to all of the bond, the bond wires inside the chip. We've cracked and decapped the chip. Um, you can see all what's left of the wires all hanging out. The traces have blown off the circuit board. Nice. There's the cap of the flash memory chip. So. Another look at it. We've also decapped the microcontroller on the other side. So this looks like a potentially feasible attack. Now, this is something, I gotta confess, um, this is something that uh, we, I shot much earlier on the show that I was on with Miles. This is the same, this is the same uh, exploding wire rig, but we're doing it here for a can crusher. This is something I just wanted to show you guys because Although we can clearly attack SSDs with high voltage, what if we could also attack aluminum platter drives with it? And sure enough, you can crush aluminum inductively. So this is uh, dumping a bunch of high voltage, high current through a coil, separated physically from a can, um, and we're gonna crush that can without contacting it. And this happens very fast. So this is a 2000 FPS, and you can see that inductive current uh, crushes that can and rips it in half in a fraction of a second. Uh, here we have another shot at 2000, different can, and that, you know, rips the coil apart, but it also cuts the can in half. Uh, here we are with some super high speed shots. This is 100,000 frames per second, and so you can see this is happening. I mean, even a fraction of a second doesn't cover it here. Um, check out this one on the right little bit blown out from the flash there, but everything that you're seeing in this video right now um, has happened in just uh, less than less than a tenth of a second. So we could do this to an aluminum case drive, I'm confident, but we don't know how much power it would take. The rig that we have um, is not powerful enough, so I didn't try that. But I wanted you guys to see that because I think it's pretty cool. 
So here's a summary um, of the research and what we learned. The uh, most feasible attacks in each category in thermal. The plasma cutter, turns out, sometimes simple is best. Uh, the oxygen injection also definitely would work with a little engineering, but you may require a sort of a complex injector to get that to happen. Um, in the kinetic side, the nail guns definitely work as long as you uh, are not super paranoid, right? If you're, if you're going against the ultimate adversary, then the nail gun alone will not work. That will exploit that drive. Um, and the damned high explosive turns out to be super feasible. Um, but you need a horizontal barrier as well. That explosive force is going to go out the side of your rack as well as up and down. And on the electric side, the high voltage power spike seems good against SSDs. The one thing is, we don't have a good idea yet about the forensic capabilities on SSDs. SSDs are weird. Um, when you overwrite data on an SSD, it doesn't necessarily actually overwrite the space that data uh, lived on. So there's still a lot to be learned about forensics on SSDs. There's a bunch of research out there right now already about erasing SSDs and then hooking them up and recovering data from the flash memory. That assumes that the memory chips haven't been damaged. In terms of uh, what can be done to a damaged flash chip that can't yet can't still be hooked up to power and read, we don't know the answer to that. So again, if your life depends on any of these methods, then you should uh, be conservative about your choices. Now I just want to leave you uh, with a little fun uh, example. We talked right at the beginning about the mobile problem, right? You've got your driverless car, it's got a hard disk in it. You've got your drone, it's got a hard disk in it. You've got your laptop, it's got a hard disk in it. We have some cautionary tales from the last few years about people who allowed their data to be taken from them while they were using it and it didn't end well for them. In particular, on the left, Ross Ulbricht, founder of the Silk Road Darknet Market, on the right, a more recent example, Alexander Kazas, the founder and operator of Alpha Bay. They were both captured by law enforcement while they were using their laptops. So their laptop, even though it was encrypted, it was unlocked. All of their data was, re was, was, uh, was recovered. Very bad for them. Ross is in prison in the United States serving a life sentence. Kazas is dead. He died within a few days of his arrest in, under uncertain circumstances in prison in Bangkok. No good. So I want to leave you with this little thought experiment about destroying your mobile data in case you get apprehended. Thank <laughs> you.